Good evening. Before we start tonight, I'd like to once again say that we're not scholars, we're not historians. What we're going to be offering is based on our experience of this practice. And if we do make errors in doing so, we apologize in advance for those. Tonight I'm going to be talking first about the territory from first sit to first jhana, and specifically addressing and uh, labeling what we're calling the landmarks along the way, of which there are seven. The first is the commencement of the nimitta. The second is the nimitta increasing and stillness developing. The third is when the nimitta becomes solid. The fourth is when the nimitta becomes energized. The fifth landmark is when the nimitta begins to move and merge with the object. The sixth is what happens when it, mer when it merges. And the seventh is first jhana. Before beginning on that, I'd like to uh, talk very, very briefly about the object of meditation. There were a few questions today about that, so I wanted to really clarify that so we're all on the same page. The object of this meditation is the breath. The place that we know the breath is in the area between the nostrils and the upper lip, what we're calling the, the, the Anapana spot. And how we know the breath is by the movement there. So just so we're all clear, that's what, that's what we're talking about with the object. Also, the, there's a way that this practice in this, in this stage of the practice is really pretty simple. And really, it's the consistency of awareness with the object. It's the first jhana factor, vitaka. So the job of the meditator is just to once... Uh, each time the awareness attention drifts or slips off of the object to constantly just return it again and again and again, no matter how many times it takes each day to do that. And ideally to do it without any self-judgment, criticism, blame, without expressing any anger or frustration if you can. When most people begin this practice and begin meditating with it, there's the settling that first starts. And most of you have come from somewhere, you've traveled, you've changed with your job, your families, all those kinds of things. So there's a time of just settling in and starting. And at first there can be a kind of relief just to be slowing down. And that's quite normal, of course. And we start getting a relationship, establishing a relationship with the object where we are trying to figure out where exactly is this and how does the breath move and what am I doing? And so that starts happening and coalescing. And initially as the mind starts to cohere and unify, uh, there can be some lights going on in the distance. And with all the lights that happen during this meditation, we don't pay attention to those. We may notice, but we'd never chase them. We never try and do anything with them. There's no technique about that. So we just stay with the object and just allow that concentration to develop, allow the mind to just deepen and still. And at some point, the nimitta does begin. The lights become more dominant. They start moving closer. There's a way that there's something that's happening. And usually by this time, the meditator is able to stay with the object for a fairly good period of each meditation period. And they're finding off the meditation cushion as well that they can stay with the object with some continuity. As this develops, a greater stillness develops and the jhana factors, which Tina will talk about a little bit later tonight, will begin to really arise. And the first two jhana factors are really the, uh, well, the first jhana factor is really your doing. It's that, again, it's that consistency of knowing the object, of, again, the breath passing at the Anapana spot, the movement there. That's your object. And as the jhana factors increase, the nimitta becomes more and more solid. It will stay in one place. 
it will usually keep uh, more and more often it'll keep a specific form the form of the nimitta can be very different some people see it as a round bright sort of headlight uh, other people can see it in different colors different shapes and of course again none of that we do we pay attention to however it presents we just let it present and we stay with the object the nimitta does become solid at this point and the access concentration is developing as the nimitta is becoming solid and the access concentration the jhana factors are increasing there's a great deal of comfort in the body there's that feeling of a kind of what we've called the love affair with the object where the body is feeling good it's not a lot of tension there's not a lot of stress the nimitta is presenting pretty strongly one is able to stay with the object very continuously at this point around this time the nimitta as the as the access concentration is increasing the nimitta becomes energized and it's like the difference between having a kind of a, li a light where the light switch is turned on there's just a way there's an electricity that comes to the nimitta at this point it almost crackles with energy for a lot of people and again the object remains the same the same object we started with we're still with all of this is unfolding without our doing anything except staying with the object the nimitta is getting generally larger it's coming closer and closer and at some point for some unknown reason it merges with the object just all at once which is the breath the which object is, being the breath correct which is the breath right there at the anapana spot the nimitta merges it just locks in all at once and sometimes it'll pull away and come back and pull away and it does come a time come a time as i say when it just locks in and it doesn't go anywhere at that point the object is still the same but the object is what we're calling the anapana nimitta meaning that the nimitta has merged with your object that's the only object you can take there's no choice you're not going to a nimitta it's there and for each of us the experience was a little bit different at that point for me it was more like a kind of a smoky breath and for tina it was a very clear merged uh, nimitta with the object with the breath and stayed that way and still what does the meditator do you stay with the object you stay with this object and you just keep the continuity going there and just allow it to be present and when there's enough purification and when the jhana factors get stronger and stronger all at once the meditator is pulled into the first jhana so there's nothing that needs to be done there's no place you need to go across there's no gulf you need to bridge all you need to do is stay with the object and all of this will unfold very very naturally with the first jhana the uh, saidao will teach about the the five masteries um, and the five masteries are a very important component of the jhanas where there needs to be a real stability about the jhana there needs to be an ability to go into the jhana at will to stay in it as long as the time resolve is for to exit when the time resolve is over and Check. just go ahead checking the jhana factors and to check the jhana factors which the side I will talk about later and in order to do this it creates a kind of stability where this is really a kind of a platform you're building where the first jhana needs to be solid and stable and the mastery needs to be there and the purification that comes with each jhana needs to be complete before one can then let go of some of the jhana factors and start moving towards the next jhana so it's a very organic process again that there isn't a lot of there isn't a lot to do by the meditator except that coming back to the object that's really again your job and all of this will unfold very very naturally yeah so just to build a little bit on that that the nimitta is just a byproduct of concentration it arises in the mind it isn't something we see with our physical eyes and sometimes people can start straining trying to see it when really as Stephen has said um, many times that is not the object until it actually merges so there's no need to try and look at it there's no need to you can't make it arise it is a byproduct of the unification of mind and um, that's what it is it's seen as a light by the wisdom eye 
not by the physical eyes. And so there's no need to strain to see it. There's no need to look for it or any of those things. It just unfolds naturally. And this whole process, it, it is, as Stephen said, very organic. It really unfolds kind of like like a plant growing or a flower opening. We can't pull it open before it's ripe. And staying with the primary object of the breath is really the way that that ripening happens organically by itself. So there's a, f- a few metaphors that we like to use as kind of a context for, for Westerners with this practice and in talking in this talk about skillful effort uh, and how that is applied in this territory from the first sitting to first jhana, which in many ways is the most, um, the bumpiest part or can be the bumpiest part of this whole uh, progression of the samatha practice. And so the, the first metaphor that we think is helpful is that of really building a muscle. What is being cultivated in this practice? We've talked about the fact that the the concentration practice is cultivating the ability to be disinterested in the hindrances, in our story, and in anything that really pulls us away, which is is a great uh, faculty to have not only here, but in the world as well. The example I gave last night of, of, you know, getting cut off in traffic or something, we suffer a whole lot more when we can't just turn away from that and let it go than we do if we stay with it for a long, long period of time after it's happened. And so every time that one, every time you're sitting all day long, the hundreds or thousands of times that you are pulled away or, or might be pulled away from the Anapana uh, meditation, to just bring the awareness back without strain, without striving, and without judgment to the object, you are building that muscle. So it's kind of like if somebody was, say, had a a 20-pound weight and was doing bicep curls, they might start out and 20 pounds might feel very heavy and because the muscle isn't very strong. But every time they lift that weight up, that muscle gets stronger and stronger And at some point, 20 pounds might not even feel heavy at all because the muscle is so strong. And so the effort that it takes to stay with the object is much less or maybe there isn't much effort at all being applied because that muscle has been developed. And that's really what is being cultivated in the concentration, in any of the concentration practices, is the the, um, ability, the strength of being able to not be interested in these other things as they as they arise and there may be the the possibility of turning off the object towards those things that ultimately will make us suffer so that's one one metaphor another is um, we call it the surf zone metaphor and i used to be a scuba diver so even if you've never done scuba diving i think this is really helpful in terms of thinking about the effort that we make in this practice, and the hindrances. So in surfing, or in um, scuba diving, there's all kinds of very heavy, laborious equipment. There's a wetsuit. Sometimes there's a hood with a wetsuit. There's um, tanks of air. There's weights that you might have to put on so that you can actually sink into the water. Um, There's the mask. There's the regulator that you breathe from. And... When you're doing a beach dive, you will put all this on and come down to the ocean and have to walk across the sand with all this stuff on. And so you've got all this heavy weight that you're carrying. And it feels, it's really awkward and hard. It's easy to fall down. But eventually you get up to the beach. And there's the surf zone is where the waves crash on the beach. And somehow you have to get the flippers on, get in the water, and get through the surf zone. And a lot of times, this is actually done going backwards into the water so that when the waves break, they hit you in the back. So it's very awkward and clumsy if you've ever seen anyone do it. Um, But eventually, you get the flippers on. And really, the job at that point is to go straight through the surf zone. As quickly as you can, you aren't paying attention to it. You're just going through that area so that ultimately, you can get past it where the waves aren't breaking anymore. And at that point, you're just really bobbing on the surface. 
and there's the possibility that maybe you'll be able to go down below the surface and actually start scuba diving. And at that point, it becomes very peaceful. You can enjoy being there, seeing the fish. You have your regulator in your mouth. It's, and it's weightless. It's almost like being an astronaut. So all this heavy equipment that you've been carrying around and lugging that's actually you know, protecting you in some way feels very weightless, and it very, it's very effortless, even though there are a lot of technical details to manage. So when the hindrances come up in this practice, that is really like going through the surf zone, and frequently what happens is the waves come, and they knock your mask off, and you're gulping down sand and you know salt water, and um, maybe the regulator's fallen out of your mouth. And really all you can do at that point is stop what you're doing and take care of what's come up. And so this is where um, the skillful effort, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow night with the hindrances, is really um, just going straight through the surf zone and not, um, not so much... Uh, investigating what's happening there. And we'll use this, this metaphor more tomorrow night when we talk about the hindrances. So there's a way that with this practice, as you get beyond um, that first to first jhana period, it starts becoming very peaceful and tranquil, and there's, there's the possibility of really um, exploring a whole lot more in the practice. The last metaphor, then, that we think is, is helpful with this is um, fr- actually from Taoism, and it's the symbol of the yin and the yang. And if you haven't, aren't familiar with the symbol, it's a circle with an S-shaped line in the middle. And I'm not a Taoist, so if I don't get all the details right, please forgive me. Um, but it's a circle with an S-shaped line. One side is white with a small black circle dot in the middle, and one side is black with a small white dot in the middle. And in considering effort, this has come up a lot in the interviews, actually. Um, Most of the time when we think about effort and skillful effort, we think about the yang energy, which in in the symbol, there's the yin and the yang. And the yang energy is more, more active. It's doing, it's proactive and going out there. It's generally associated with masculine, but of course... All of us have both of these. And that is really needed. As Stephen said, we we need to apply our attention to the object. And so there is a sense of needing to do something at different times. But what often gets overlooked, especially at this stage of the practice, is the yin. And in the yin energy of the symbol, it's a receptive energy. It's receiving. It's waiting. It's um, really... In this case, letting the practice do you. And what we've found is that a lot of times people can become out of balance with the striving of the the yang energy and seeing that really the only way to apply skillful effort is by the doing. And in this practice, because it is so still and serene, Uh, there's really a need to have the balance with letting the practice do you. And as we we talked about last night, going through the different levels of the jhanas, it becomes more and more important to, uh, to not have so much of me doing things and to allow the practice to really do you, just the way that a plant comes out of the ground because that's, what the nat- that's what the nature of it is, and it's a natural unfolding. So those are a few ways of just framing the practice that can be helpful as we start thinking about skillful effort. And we, we want to be clear, we're not really referring to this as wise effort in the Eightfold Path, but more as just how to apply everyday skillful effort to the practice. And in applying skillful effort, I'd like to, to just draw upon the one metaphor that Tina used of the yin and yang, the, the, which I want to frame as action effort being what's normally considered the more masculine energy and receiving effort as more of a feminine energy. And uh, as an example, if you were standing at the top of a fairly steep hill and you wanted to get to the bottom to deliver a very important message, 
what you would do more than likely is you would start running as fast as you can but you wouldn't continue running as fast as you can you wouldn't continue the action effort because at some point speed and gravity are going to come into play here and they're going to help carry you down the hill so if you don't slow down your action and let gravity and speed carry you down the hill the rest of the way you're going to fall and if you stop and sit down, you're not going to make it to the bottom of the hill. So you need both of these in the right balance of the movement, the fast running, and the relaxing and allowing the force to carry you as well. And in, the, in this case, and in this practice, again, the action effort, as I said before, is the vitaka. It's that continuously coming back to the object. But when you're on the object, you don't need to keep coming back to it. You can just relax. <laughs> You can just allow that to be present. That's what's happening is you're on the object. So just let that develop without doing anything. And this is the real fine line for those of us that are the real strivers, and I'm one of them, that you have to learn. Because you can't do this practice all by yourself. You have to let a kind of universal energy and awareness come in and help carry you into the practice, help the practice develop. So it's a very important point. And along the lines, what I said last night is it's really critical to put down what you know. You're all very experienced meditators. You know a lot of meditative technique and strategy, and you really have to put that down to really stay clean with this practice and allow this practice to develop. One of the other problems people have is there are particularly people that have read a lot. Um, have read a number of the texts or have uh, practiced this many times before, they know the practice really, really well. And what happens is there can be a compulsive need to try to compare them, what's happening with them to what the path is, to where they are. So they're constantly evaluating every meditation, every time they're on the object. Okay, what am I now? What's happening? What are the lights? What stage? And that's, that's counterproductive because you're putting your energy into that, which means you're thinking and you're evaluating, which guarantees you're not on the object. So again, you're doing an activity that's not skillful and it's d destructive to the building of the, of the uh, concentration. It's also important in starting this practice to really have a clarity around what's your intention here, what's your aspiration, why, why, he, why are you here? It's, it's not, uh, you know, you're here for uh, ultimately liberation. You're ultimately here to, to do the entire Buddha's path. So to know that that's why you're here, that liberation is what's dependent on what your actions are, really helps motivate the activity. And there's an attitude that we can develop, really one of openness and acceptance and surrender of doing it our way. Because again, our way, what we need to do is just come back to the object and forget about all the rest, the strategizing and all the good effort. Persistence is very, very important here. But persistence, again, has to be done properly. Like Sayadaw gave the example the first night of the lute, the ancient stringed instrument. And if the string is too tight, if there's too much effort and too much persistence, the string breaks. And what that looks like in practice is that there's restlessness and striving. If there's too little persistence, if our string isn't tight enough, then we can get into laziness and sloth and torpor. So we need to really see that balance and notice when those things are happening. We're not watching, we're not, we're not really you know, trying to track these things, but clearly when we're overexcited, it's a pretty good indication that we're doing too much personal effort. And if we're, we're not, if we're just really feeling sluggish, it means we're not bringing enough effort and energy and persistence to the object. There's a kind of quality also that we can know of the object. And uh, I, we have friends who do kayaking, you know, the, the boat with the, uh, an oar on each side. And they talk about when they're in a stream or river and they're paddling, when they hit that current, they call it riding the rail. And in this practice, too, there's a way that we ride the rail when, when it's just right. When we're on the object, it's happening. We don't need to do a lot. That's the time not to do a lot, to just let it be, let it develop, really ride that rail, find that current. That's, there's a quality to the being on the object. And so you can notice that. You don't need to go looking for it. 
You don't need to make it happen, but just really when you taste that, just let it develop by itself. And again, the relaxing of personal effort is very critical, and we've, uh, I've talked about it enough, but I just want to emphasize that. When, when it's working, you don't have to do anything. Just stay with the object. You don't have to keep applying it, so just let it develop on its own. And when there's silence and when there's stillness and when the object is clear, just really let it, let it just deepen. One of the times also to relax personal effort is when, as Tina said, going through the surf zone, when there's a lot of hindrances and there can be defilements coming up that we're not paying attention to or trying not to engage or turning away from. But when that starts lessening and lessening, there's a time when we know we can tell that we're getting through the surf zone and we're almost out to the ocean where there's a lot of calm water. So really allow that to happen and relax your effort there. So again, this is a developing of that continuity and really the deep qualitative knowing when you're on the object to appreciate that and work with that. One of the things we've found useful and even in um, on our retreat, we could see that each of us had a different style of, that we brought to the practice. And so afterwards, it was kind of fun to compare notes as to how um, what was skillful, what wasn't so skillful, and where they were the same and different. And I think this is one of the things when we're working with people, or you can even do this for yourself, to really think about what do you uniquely bring to the practice as and your strengths as a meditator. So we thought we'd share just a few snippets um, just to give you examples of of ourselves and two other people and some of the strengths they bring so that you can start, you know, maybe you already know this, but to really use what you do bring to the practice as a faculty as part of your skillful effort. For me, I found that really uh, what I was good at was the Vitaka piece. The really, as I said, the c- continuously coming back to the object. And if I had to do that a million times in a day, I was perfectly fine with that. I didn't have any uh, much uh, criticism or self-judgment. I knew that was my job, was just to come back again and again. And that was one of the things that really was beneficial to me, was to really get the continuity going. And for me, there was also, uh, I I needed to do occasional long sits. It was just the way I'm wired. And when, you know, the practice was developing and the access concentration was available, then, you know, I would, I began a practice of sitting all night, one night a week. And I don't recommend it to everybody, but there, for me, it was the right thing to do because it really helped accelerate when I was in that place of, when the object was very continuous, it allowed it really to deepen substantially. And again, I don't recommend it if it's not how you're wired, but just the point is for you to really know from your history of meditating, what do you do well? You know, are you really good at morning sits? Then make your morning sits longer. Are you really good in the evening? Same thing. So really just do an evaluation. I mean, as a meditator, we all have gifts. So what's your specific gift in this skill? Yeah, and for me, I'm not so good at the at the um, marathons, uh, but I have a real sort of meticulous continuity where um, over time there aren't very many gaps between uh, in staying on the object. So it's it's more of the vichara. And with enough of that, even though, I mean, there were times over long retreats where my amount of sleep will go down, but I, I need sleep. And so that Stephen's approach doesn't really work for me, but really being meticulous throughout the day works better for me. So, you know, these are just two examples of what our natural tendencies are and how that we could really lean into those to help the practice develop. And we, we know of two other yogis, just to give you a few more examples. And one of these people really has a deep faith in the practice and a, such a, a strong trust in the Buddha and the teachings in the Sayadaw and uh, his presentation of the Buddha's teachings. And so when, when this yogi had difficulties come up, or even at the very beginning, that faith carried this person through many things, and it was a very reliable strength to bring to the practice. And then there was yet another person who really just was very trusting in following the teachings exactly. 
this person didn't ever question whether they should do it this way or that. Whatever this, the teacher's instructions were, the person just did it exactly that way. And so it was very easy for that person to um, stay with it. They didn't have to be thinking about, should I do this, should I do that? They just followed the instructions as they were, and it eliminated a lot of mentalizing about what to do. So understanding would have been a strength for that person. So there's really just the encouragement is to find your own strengths and build on those because you all, you all have them and you probably know what they are. And those can be brought to this practice in a, in a fruitful way. We'd like to also talk tonight about the jhana factors. And this becomes important in this territory from first sit to first jhana as well as all the way through up to the fourth jhana. The jhana factors do play a role. And one sort of general comment to say about the jhana factors is that one never takes a jhana factor as an object. We know there are other presentations of the jhana practice where one intentionally takes the jhana factor as an object. And just to be clear, just as with the nimitta and other um, things that may arise, they are byproducts of concentration and unification of mind. They aren't the object of it. And so, say, with the nimitta, the only, the only time that becomes the object is when it merges with the anapana spot. So the jhana factors are the same. It's the same uh, kind of rule that we don't take them as an object. So the five jhana factors are vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, and ekagata. Those are the poly terms and... Uh, usually the, the side likes to use those terms so when you're interviewing... It's good to just know what they are. They translate, uh, and then I'll go through them. Vitaka is applied attention. So this is what Stephen's been talking about, the application of the attention back to the object over and over again. Then vichara is the sustained attention. This is really the continuity, the over time without break. So the, we like to think of vitaka as consistency, where you're just doing it over and over again. Whereas um, vichara is the continuity where there aren't as many breaks. And then PT is translated as either joy or rapture. And all of these are mentally produced, but, but PT in particular can feel sometimes as though it's in the body. It's more bodily sensed joy or rapture. And, and actually sometimes can be too much and can be, feel a little bit gross. All of these start feeling gross as, as the jhana progression happens. And then sukha is translated as bliss. It's more of a mentally, it's, it feels more m- like a mental happiness. It's more uh, bubbly, kind of like a carbonated water or something, and is really not so much experienced as bodily, but is more, more a mental happiness. And then ekagata is one-pointedness. And this is really the concentration as we talk about it, the one-pointedness on the object of meditation. So as these then relate to the jhanas, in the first jhana, all five factors are present. And really, vitaka and vichara are the most noticeable because this is so close to our normal consciousness that um, we need to, it's easy to wobble at that point and and be... um, needing to keep making that effort of applying and sustaining the attention. So if you just look at percentages in the first jhana, five factors that are present, uh, vitaka and vichara might be 50%, and so the other jhana factors may not be as noticeable. Uh, You know, everybody's different, but they are all five present. And then in the second jhana, the first two factors drop. So what's left is pt, sukha, and ekagata. And in this case, usually PT is predominant. And there's, there, you know, again, everybody has their own sense of what it feels like, but there can be a lot of the PT uh, experienced in the, the second jhana. And then in the third jhana, PT drops. And what is left is sukha and ekagata, so happiness and one pointedness. It's much more, there's a real refinement that starts happening there of. Um, 
being much less of a bodily sensation because, of course, PT has dropped at that point. And then in the fourth jhana, sukha drops, and what's left is ekagata and then upeka, which is equanimity, arises as the, the more the feeling tone factor. And then ekagata and upeka are the two jhana factors that remain throughout all of the formless jhanas from there on. And you can imagine in the fourth jhana, with just one pointedness and equanimity, there's uh, it's much more neutral. There's more of a sense of um, equanimity and neutrality, as if you were to compare that with, say, something like rapture. So there, there is a sense in going through these jhanas of each of these, as the jhana matures, as the masteries are happening that each of the lower factors starts feeling gross and there is a natural tendency for those to start dropping as the concentration continues to uh, strengthen and the mind coheres more and more throughout these, throughout those first four jhanas. I'd like to mention uh, six actions that support the practice here. And I'll mention them briefly in a little more detail. The first is putting down what we know. Second, focus on the object. Third is silence. Fourth, breathing. Fifth, timing. And sixth, rigor. And the first, uh, putting down what we know, we've talked about already. It's really that, that cultivating and that welcoming of the beginner's mind, of coming fresh to the practice without bringing uh, the, our meditative history uh, in toolkit with us. And the second is focus on the object at all times. It's that continuity. Uh, you know, if we're boiling a pot of water, if we keep taking the, the lid off to look in to see if it's boiling, it's going to take many times uh, longer to boil than it would if you just left the lid on, lid on. So to really develop the continuity and allow that to really deepen is quite important. And silence. Of course, here we have great external environmental silence around us. There's not much talking we're really able to, to stay uh, with that. But it's also, again, renouncing the self-talk. It's really uh, staying away from the judging, the thinking about what's happening, the evaluation, the comparing ourselves to other meditators, and really allowing the intimacy with the inner silence to develop and really deepen and draw us deeper into the practice. We find that when we're with this practice and the continuity is building and the jhana factors are arising and the thoughts are thinning and thinning because we're turning away from them. We're not giving them extra energy. We're allowing them just to to go off like a, a cloud in the sky just to pass over. We don't, we don't add extra energy or follow them. You can find that there's a, an impulse prior to thinking, meaning that if I need a drink of water, at this point, I might say to myself, oh, I need a drink of water. Where will I get it? How will I get it? And there's a whole thinking process. And what happens is when the thinking is thinning out and stopping, there's a way that there's just a knowing that water is needed and one goes and gets it. There isn't the whole process. And the process of thinking begins to feel very, very cumbersome and too much. Breathing in this practice, of course, the breath is the object. So breathing is very important. Uh, but it's also not forcing the breath, not making the breath long or short, not not having it do anything. Let the breath develop because the breath really becomes more discreet, more subtle as we get stiller and stiller with it. And there's discussion. Uh, people ask a lot about with the fourth jhana, whether the breath really stops or not. And we'll say that the, the, the texts say that, yes, the breath does stop. And if, in fact, you reach fourth jhana, please don't worry about whether the breath stops or not. The body survives. Everyone who's done this practice is still alive. No one's died in fourth jhana, so you don't need to worry about this. But there's a way that the body can go into panic when there's a sense that you're not getting enough air. And, of course, the urge is to take a big gulp of air. And when you do that, it completely derails the concentration and you're set back a few paces here. So... If you get to that place and the breath seems very, very discreet or maybe is stopped, just let it be because the body knows what to do, the practice knows what to do, and you're not going to be in any danger. The timing, 
meditation timing, of course, uh, as I've shared, this is a, an important topic for me personally, uh, and I need uh, periods of a lot of time. Usually what we recommend with people is try to sit, try to just extend whatever your comfort zone is. If you're comfortable sitting an hour and a half, try and go another 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It's okay if it's a little bit uncomfortable. You don't want to just stay in that comfort zone of timing because this practice really deepens and develops if you can sit a little longer and a little longer and a little longer because it really allows the, uh, uh, you know, the, the progression of the practice really substantially deepens the longer and longer you sit. So if you're able to sit two hours and then go to three hours, there's a, a really exponential difference between the two meditations in our experience. And it doesn't mean every three-hour meditation is better than a two-hour, but it means when you're able to do that, that it allows a kind of steeping to happen and a, and a deepening of the practice. We found that when we were practicing with the side out, and the side out recommended that we sit three or four hours, our first reaction was, we can't do that. And we can't do it because we haven't done it. So really what this is about is the mental limitation to say, well, just because I haven't done it doesn't mean I can't. It doesn't mean I can't develop that. So we really encourage a flexibility of mind around this and an idea. And really, you might be surprised if you really just put that aside and see what you can do. And the rigor of this practice, again, comes back to the continuity. It comes back to from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, where is your awareness? Where is the attention? It should be on the object. If you wake up in the middle of the night, Where's the awareness? Where's the attention? Should be on the object. And if you start doing this repeatedly each day and every day, you'll find again that it will develop very beautifully and the continuity will lock in place, which is the uh, vichara that uh, Tina was mentioning. Anyway, those are the six actions that we recommend that support this practice. Yeah, and I'll just say, with regard to the timing, I think for me, I had done so many years of Vipassana practice, which, of course, has a momentary object. And we really, we have both done practices for many, many years with, that had a momentary object as the object of meditation. And there's a real difference with, the, with doing concentration meditation where you have a stable object and our, our level of ability to sit longer because the jhana factors are arising and when they start arising sometimes the body doesn't hurt anymore and um so there there is i just would encourage you to hold that as a possibility that what you have maybe experienced in practices that use a momentary object isn't the same standard as with concentration practice as your concentration starts deepening. Because when, when the side out asked me to sit for, for three or four hours, I, I said, I can't do that, you know. And he really had the faith that I could, and so I tried. And because I think of, the, of his faith and the, and the difference in the practice and my sort of willingness to abandon what I thought I knew, um, those, those kinds of things became possible. So... You know, this is where that balance, you don't want to turn it into another way of striving. But um, but I would say there is, part of it is the mental limitation. That was, for me, I'll say, that was the bigger factor, I think. So at this point, we are um, ready to take any questions that you might have. Any questions this evening? Yeah, that's a good question. We've we've had that before. Yeah. You might want to repeat the question. So the question was, what's the difference between sustained attention and one pointedness? Yeah, and the, the sustained attention, there's to us this we think of it more as the continuity. So over time we're not falling off the object as much. That might be one way of looking at it. The one pointedness in terms of the factors there is there is a progression, and there there 's a relationship between those two to me, the one pointedness is really there 's a sense of locking into that object that by the time the fourth jhana is arising 
I mean, one pointedness is there even in the first jhana. So, so again, all five factors are present in the first jhana, including one pointedness and sustained attention, plus the other three. So as the jhanas progress and applied and sustained attention drop, they drop after the first jhana. What's left is one pointedness. And so there's a really, there's a very much of a different sense of the one pointedness as the jhanas are progressing up to the point in fourth jhana where all that's left is one pointedness and equanimity. So in the, in the first jhana, if you're trying to sense, oh, is, is one point in this here, is sustained attention here, are they all here, I would say don't, don't worry too much about that, about differentiating. It becomes more important after the first jhana. So there's a whole procedure that we won't get into for checking to see which jhana factors are there. This is one of the, the five masteries that the Saidao will teach you if you get to that point um, where you can check and confirm what jhana factors are actually present after the jhana ends, after the absorption ends. I don't know if that helped or not, if that answered the question or not. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if you're, are you asking because you're wondering if one point in this is arising? Okay. It, you know, like Tina says, there really is a, a kind of a locking in. And, and the, the, the sense is that you, you almost couldn't get off the object if you wanted to. It's just, it's there all the time, 24 hours a day, just locked in. So th- that's the big difference, is the continuity, which is just, it's staying. And the locked inness where, you know, if you, if you, tr- you know, like it's, like it's super glued on your lip. If you tried to get it off, you couldn't. It's sort of like that. Yeah, this is, that's a great explanation. In, in the first jhana where the two applied and sustained attention are there, you're still having to do that to keep the concentration up. After that, I mean, you may be walking around with your eyes open seeing the nimitta. You know, that, that could possibly be happening. You're not having to do very much because there's a sense that it's just there all the time. There, there's a real locking in. And at that point, the effort becomes... That, that particular kind of effort of applying and sustaining the attention isn't really needed anymore. Which is the reason it's dropped for the second job. Yeah. I mean, it's really, like Tina says, walking around, and even if you blink with your eyes are shut for a split second, you see the nimitta. And sometimes with eyes open, the nimitta is present too. So it, again, it's not that you're doing anything. That's the big difference. Yeah, what's happening at that point is the mind is just cohering more and more, but it's not because of the same kind of effort. This is the surf zone. This is why, for us, the surf zone metaphor becomes important because once you're through it, you don't have to deal with the waves anymore. There are things you're doing, but they're not the same level of effort that it takes to get through the surf zone. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, we have one announcement, and we wanted to just clarify that with the interviews, at this point we've met with almost everybody, and the interviews from here on are really, um, I guess, optional might be one way of describing it, but you don't have to come every day. You can come when you need to. It's, it's good to come a minimum of twice a week, uh, and this will be ongoing even beyond you know our time here, of course. Uh, but if you have something you want to report, if there's something coming up in your practice, if you have a question, any of those things are good reasons to come, but you don't have to feel like you need to come every single day, even though I I believe that interviews will be offered, if not every day, almost every day. So um, just to let you know that, you know, that it's really for you as needed. So at this point, we'd like to um, dedicate the merit of the day's practice to the benefit of all beings.
Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.